All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going out there? Here's Cornelius Jones. And as promised, we are continuing in our discussion with eschatology and biblical prophecy. And as you can see, I'm in my car again. <laughs> you know, guys, I'm just I've just been so busy. I got a new job and I'm, uh, that job is, uh, you know, got nine to five hours there and then got to pick up my kids and get them fed, spend some time with them. And, and then at nights, I'm, uh, you know, I'm driving for Uber, trying to, you know, make a little extra money and things of that nature. So your boy's on a busy schedule. <laughs> All right. And so it just as recently as just seemed to have worked for me where, you know, I, the time I actually get just happens to be in the car. So. Uh, if I had to wait to get home, I wouldn't get as many videos out, okay? And so, excuse the background noise if you hear cars flying by. Uh, but anyway, here we are. Whether I'm at my table or in my car, the content remains the same. And that is my goal, uh, to continue to study and put out great content for you guys to learn and grow. So I pray that you are uh, just praying with me, keep them, keeping me lifted up as I put these videos out by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> All right. So guys, thank you for watching, uh, subscribing and staying tuned. And so let's, with, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the discussion at hand. Today is a great one. Today is a very important one. Today we are discussing the question, why would Jesus Christ return to the animal sacrifices? For those of you who follow eschatology, you know that Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth for a 1,000 year reign. In this 1,000 year reign, he is going to put Satan in the abyss and it will be a time of perfect peace and order as Jesus Christ rules, as what the Bible says, with a rod of iron. He's going to rule. There will be people still be on the earth populating, having babies, and we will, we will be here with Christ ruling in our different assignments in glorified bodies. You also know that there will be a third temple. This is the temple that the Antichrist will actually desecrate during, the, during Daniel's 70th week. Then when Christ returns, he's going to judge the Antichrist and he's going to cleanse this temple. And this temple in Jerusalem is going to be the temple that actually King David is going to be the prince over, of course, under the headship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So this temple, Jesus is going to reign from his headquarters in Jerusalem in this temple. All of this is described in very in detail in the last eight chapters of the book of Ezekiel. Now, many people have a problem with the idea that sacrifices will be going on during the time that Jesus is on the earth. And the reason why is they believe it is a direct contradiction to, contradiction to scripture. Well, we're gonna look in that today. Does the idea of animal sacrifices, does it contradict the one perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us on the cross. Well, if you read chap if you read Hebrews, it's understandable why one could think this is a contradiction. However, it is not. First, you got to understand the Bible says very plainly in the prophecy of Ezekiel that there will be sacrifices. So what do we do with that? Well, obviously, it is an understand it is understanding with our interpretation that's the problem. The Bible is never the problem, okay? So we're going to dig into Hebrews, and we're going to answer this question. Why would Jesus return to the, to the imperfect sacrificial system when he has already provided the perfect sacrifice with his own blood when he died on the cross, okay? And so let's go ahead and jump into this. The answer to this seemingly contradiction is found in the book of Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm going to start at verse 11. Watch this. Let's jump into this. It says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption 
verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the puring, excuse me, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of his death, excuse me, by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So here we see in this passage, the writer of Hebrews is in all throughout chapter 9 and 10, we see clearly that there is a, a great distinction between the animal sacrifices and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Okay, The animal sacrifices were an imperfect system however they had to they had to do it because God ordered them to do it and we see further in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 watch this it says for the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect for then would they have not ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have would have had no more consciousness of sin but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins so you see here when you read this, it's like, wait a minute, what Hebrew, it seems like Hebrews is talking down on the animal sacrifices, okay? But that's not what the writer of Hebrews is doing. The writer of Hebrews is not talking down on the animal sacrifices. What he is doing is exemplifying the perfect sacrifice of Christ, okay? That's what the writer is doing. He's exemplifying and saying how much more, how much greater Christ's sacrifice is over the animal sacrifices. Okay, so we see in chapter 10 that the animal sacrifices, that they were shadows of those that, of that which was to come, which is Jesus Christ. And it was an imperfect system. It was, an, it was not the thing that is to come, which is Christ. However, with all that being said, that does not mean that the animal sacrifices did not have a purpose. Okay. Now, to answer this question, because it see, we see clearly that the sacrifices have been done away with today. Well, that's yes, that's today. There's no temple. Okay. God allowed the Jews' temple to be destroyed as a punishment and uh, for the sins because they were for their sins of rejecting Jesus Christ. But clearly Ezekiel says there will be a third temple. So how do we wrestle with this? How do we reconcile this seeming contradiction? Well, the answer is specifically in verse 13 of chapter 9. I'm going to read it real slow and then we're going to discuss it. Okay, here's the answer. Verse, Hebrews chapter 9 verse, excuse me, verse 12 and 13. It says, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the holy place the most holy place once and for all having obtained eternal redemption verse 13 watch this for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience from dead works so here is the line that Hebrews is drawing here there is a difference what well, we must understand here there is a distinction the Bible is making between the purifying of the flesh and the purifying of the conscience okay I'm gonna read it again because I'm about to say something and if you're not with me it's it, it's gonna sound like you are gonna be like what what are you talking about listen to what scripture saying 
We we'll read it again, verse thirteen. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, through whom the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works? You see that the animal sacrifices cleansed the flesh; Jesus cleansed the conscience. So what we're trying to answer is, why would Jesus return to animal sacrifices? Here is why. The answer is found when you, when you answer this question. When you look at and decipher what the animal sacrifices did do and what the animal sacrifices did not do. That's what Hebrews is about right here. But then you further have to look at Christ's sacrifice and look and answer the same question. When it comes to Christ's sacrifice, what did his sacrifice do? And what did his sacrifice <laughs> and what are the things his sacrifice did not do? Now I got to be careful with this because if you're not with me, you're going to completely misunderstand what I'm saying and you're going to be like, "No, wait a minute. What is he what is he trying to teach here?" Watch this. When it comes, remember, we're, we're making the distinction between the flesh and the conscience. Okay? So let's answer the question for the animal sacrifices. What did the animal sacrifices do? Well, according to verse 13, it cleansed, it sanctified for the purifying of the flesh. But the problem with that was that it was a temporal cleansing. That's the problem. Because in verse 10, it goes on and talks, excuse me, in chapter 10, it goes on and talks about in the first few verses how if it was a perfect system, then they wouldn't have to do it over and over and over again. But it was an imperfect system because it cleansed for the flesh temporarily, but year after year, they had to continually do it over and over. Why? Because sin was still prevalent. But what it did do was temporarily cleansed their flesh so that they could be cleansed cleansed for worship in the temple. Okay? So that's what the animal sacrifices did. Not only that, it was also a foreshadow of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it showed our need for the Savior. So that's what the animal sacrifices did. Now let's discuss what the animal sacrifices did not do. The animal sacrifices had nothing to do with a pure conscience. It did not get rid of the guilt of sin and the shame of sin. It did not do anything for the conscience. It did not cleanse spiritually and make us new in Christ. That's what the animal sacrifices did not do. Okay? Now... What the animal sacrifices did not do, Jesus Christ did. So when we're answering the question, what did Jesus' sacrifice do? Jesus' one-time sacrifice purified or sanctified forever those who have placed their faith in him. But purified us how? It purified us spiritually, once and for all, forever. In verse 15 it says, and for this reason... He is of chapter 9, verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. The eternal inheritance is the Holy Spirit living in you. So God's promise of the new covenant is I will no longer write my laws on tablets, but I will write my laws in your heart. That is done went by the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us, the moment that we believe, we are saved. That is the guarantee of our inheritance. That is God writing his laws on our heart that cleanses our conscience. Now our sins are cleansed con with a conscience. As, as, as regards to our conscience and we are cleansed spiritually that only took one sacrifice one sacrifice was all it took we are cleansed spiritually for eternity no more sacrifices need to happen 
for that to happen. We are saved the moment we come to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? However, there is also something that Jesus' sacrifice did not do. Now, before I get into this, understand what I'm saying here. Okay? Because I'm not saying that Jesus Christ's sacrifice was imperfect. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Jesus' sacrifice was perfect for the cleansing of the spirit, for the cleansing of the conscience. But it was not God's will for Jesus Christ to cleanse the flesh. You see, the animal sacrifices cleanse the flesh. Jesus' sacrifice did not cleanse the flesh. Okay? Now, how do we know this? Well, it's easy. The Bible says very clearly that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? So when the fact now you if you are a Christian and you have placed your faith in Christ, why can't you go to heaven in this current body? Well, you can't because this body has been corrupted with sin. And even though you are a faithful believer in Jesus Christ, this body, this physical body has not been redeemed. It is your soul on the inside of you that has been redeemed by Christ, not your physical body. Do you understand that? That's why even though you're a Christian, you still get sick. And even though you're a Christian, you still get old. Even though you're a Christian, the older you get, the wearier you get. And we still get cancer. We still get diseases. All of these things are a direct result of sin. Remember, the wages of sin is death. So yes, Jesus redeemed us from spiritual death, but he did not redeem us from, he did not redeem us, excuse me, he never redeemed us from the physical death. We all die, okay? We all die unless the, those of us who are alive and remain when the rapture happens, all right? Now, understanding that, that's why when Jesus returns to the earth, People will still need to come to faith in Christ and be cleansed spiritually by the one sacrifice that Jesus already made. But understand, because his physical presence will still will be on the earth, there will need to be not just a spiritual cleansing, but there will also need to be a physical cleansing so that we can stand in the presence of God and not die. Now understand, those of us who have glorified bodies, we won't need this physical cleansing because we will have new bodies. This cleansing for animal sacrifices are only for the living mortals who will still be struggling with sin and will be required to go to the temple to worship. Okay? So that's the difference there. This is not a contradiction at all. The writer of Hebrews is exalting the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. However, the sacrifices that for, of the animals was necessary, even though it was imperfect, even though it was temporal, it was still necessary because it cleansed the flesh. Didn't cleanse it perfectly because they had to do it over and over. And that's exactly what they're going to have to do in the millennial reign. You see here, it says in chapter 10, verse 5, it says, well, verse 4, it is not possible that the flesh of bulls and goats could take away sins. And in the millennial reign, that will still be the case. The blood of bulls and goats will never take away sins. It, it didn't then and it won't. It, it didn't back then and it won't during the millennial reign. They will, the blood of bulls and goats will never take away sins. However, what it will do is temporarily cleanse physically so that they can go into the temple and stand in God's presence. You see, even though I'm a Christian and you're a Christian, do you really think that God can stand in your presence even though you're a Christian? If Almighty God showed his presence to you, you see, in that day, we're going to be able to see his face, y'all. Okay? In that day... When God's presence, almighty Jesus, almighty presence is, do you think you can stand next to Jesus and live? Of course not. <laughs> okay. I'm a believer in Christ, but because of my sins, if Christ came and sat in this car next to me, I would drop dead because his glory is just too awesome. Okay. That's why 
Moses, even though he was a believer, when Jesus took him out on Mount on the Mount, he said, "Okay, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you my presence, but I'm only gonna show you my back." And he had to do what? A uh, animal sacrifice first. Okay. So I hope that's understandable to you guys. I hope that makes sense to you. I'm sweating a little bit here. <laughs> okay. So one more time. Why will Jesus return the sacrifices? Because God's physical presence will be on the earth. And the living mortals will be required to go to the temple to worship. The sacrificial system is God's mechanism to cleanse temporarily, physically, so that they can participate in worship and not drop dead in his presence. However, they will not, it will not be a perfect system and it will do nothing to cleanse their conscience. Their conscience will not be cleansed unless they come to faith in Christ and receive the gift of the new covenant through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so animal sacrifices did one thing, cleanse temporal for the flesh. The perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ did another. It cleansed and gave us redemption spiritually. Okay, and that is what it, his blood will do for all the whole millennial reign. And that's why God needs to bring back the animal sacrifices. So I hope this makes sense. It is not a contradiction to Hebrews, the fact that there will be sacrifices. And quite frankly, it's nothing to argue about. If you, you can't debate me on this, anybody who's out there, because the writer of Hebrews, I mean, excuse me, the writer Ezekiel gives eight full chapters describing the details of temple worship. And we know this is not the temple that existed in the past. OK, one quick nugget for you. Did you know when, if you read through the eight chapters in Ezekiel that describes the temple and all the ordinances, when you do, the temple is described very de in much detail, it does not fit Zerubbabel's description of the temple that was up in, uh, for Zerubbabel and is nowhere close to the temple that was up uh, when we're talking about Solomon's temple. Okay, so we know it's the future temple. But however, did you know that in the third temple, there will be no veil? Okay, that is amazing. There is no description of a veil in the third temple. Why? Because Jesus is the veil and he destroyed the veil when he gave his body on the cross. The veil represented separation between man and the holies of holies. Therefore, with the veil being torn, as it says right here in, in Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus Christ is the veil. And those of us who have placed our faith in him, we can enter the holy of holies and we can worship the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10. Watch what it says here in verse 11. It says, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. And they never will. Verse 12, but this man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. And verse 26, it says, no, not verse 26, verse 20. Oh, where's the verse I wanted to read? Verse 19, I'm sorry. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So Jesus is the veil. The veil that existed in the previous temples represented the separation between man and God. The third temple will not have a veil. There is no description in Ezekiel of a veil in the third temple. I think that is really awesome. Okay. So I think that's awesome there. So guys, I hope that made sense to you. You know, put your comments in the comments section. And so I'm going to sign off here uh, real quick before I sign off. Just a, a little brief commercial. Okay. I was explaining to you guys that, you know, I have a new job now that I'm very excited about. Um, I have always been into investing in ways to, you know, build for retirement and build wealth for my, you know, for the future, for the future generations, for my children and things of that nature. And so I just want to ask you a quick question. You know, are you prepared for retirement? You know, there are a lot of Americans, unfortunately, are not prepared for retirement these days. 
And if you are not prepared, prepared for a retirement and you don't feel like you have enough in your 401k or your IRA, I want to uh, just let you know that there is a private lending opportunity with the company that I work for. It is called American Real Estate Investors and it's right here in Dallas, Texas. And they're working on a, a, a commercial development project where investors who invest are making immediate returns of 10.5% annually. And this is a very safe investment. What happens is, as a private uh, money lender, you are putting yourself in the position of a bank. So instead of uh, pay us, you know, the paying the bank interest, we're paying the lenders. We're paying the private investors uh, interest. And this is guaranteed interest that you receive of 10.5%. So for example, if you invested $100,000, you're going to get $875 every single month. Okay? And that's for 18 months. At the end of 18 months, you can roll your 100000 into another account. I mean, another uh, deal. Or you can pull it out. It's completely up to you. But there are a lot of people who may not have that type of cash flow. But did you know that you could self-direct your 401k or your IRA? You know, it makes sense to me. If you already have that amount and that money's not doing anything for you, just sitting there, it's just sitting there. Why not use that and you still keep it, but it is earning interest for you and building wealth for you for the future. Okay, so I just wanted to put that out there. If there's anybody that would like more information about how you could self-direct your 401k or IRA into a uh, private lending opportunity where you will be getting interest payments of 10% <laughs> on your money and, you, and it's growing for you and your family, if that's something you're interested in, I want you to shoot me an email, corneliusjones1980 at gmail.com. I'm not going to put my business email out right now because I don't want it that to get flooded. But corneliusjones1980 at gmail.com. Go ahead and email me. If you're interested, email me. Put in the description, you know, private money lending or something like that. And what I will do, I will just put your phone number in the email and I will call you directly. All right. I'm going to call you from my cell phone. All right. <laughs> because uh, this opportunity is just really great. And I want to be able to just talk to you about what you're looking for and how uh, my company that I'm working for now can possibly help your needs as it relates to investing and building wealth for your children and your family. All right. So email me Cornelius Jones, 1980 at gmail.com. Put in the, uh, in the, um, in the topic, uh, private lending opportunity and I'll call you on my cell phone just put your number in the email I'd love to talk to you guys about that all right so that's the commercial this is Cornelius Jones thank you for guys for sharing thank you for subscribing we will come back in a couple days with the next video I cannot wait you don't want to miss it so stay tuned I'm about to sign off because I am sweating like a sinner in church they like to say <laughs> some people say <laughs> all right guys I'm getting I'm about to get out this hot car and I will see you guys on the next video email me and peace out love you in the lord take care